Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Well, good morning. Good to see all of you here today. Hey, let's give a hand to all the Rockbrook family that's joining us online today, live streaming. Tell them thanks for... Thanks for tuning in. We're having a great time here, and we hope you're having a great time wherever you're watching it, whenever you're watching it. We've got a lot of people who watch uh, throughout the week. It's kind of a cool deal. But uh, we're kicking off a new four-part sermon series on the book of Philippians today. But before we jump into the text, I wanted to give you uh, a quick update about uh, this year's celebration offering. Uh, if you weren't here last week, Pastor Ryland introduced uh, the concept. Our celebration offering is something that we've done around here every year for years. And uh, we do it from kind of uh, November, December, Thanksgiving, and Christmas to the end of the year. And it's an opportunity for us to, to be thankful and to celebrate what God has done for us and to do it by giving a, a special gift over and above. You know, we've got a lot to celebrate as uh, 2020 comes to an end. Um, thank God it's coming to an end. And, uh, but you know, God really has been good to us uh, around here, and so we want to thank him for that. And uh, this year we're using our celebration offering to help a church in India. Uh, since uh, 2008, Rockbrook has been working with a church planting network uh, in North India. And when I first went over and started, there were 20 pastors uh, in the network, and uh, we've planted over 25,000 churches. We've seen over, well over a million people come to faith in Christ as a result of that. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's been amazing. And one of the key partnerships that we have is with a church in the city of Lucknow, which is the capital of the state of Uttar Pradesh, and it's called the Life Center Church. And the Life Center Church started as a church plant on the outskirts of the city, and the city has grown around it, and the church itself has grown to a thriving church. They have about 400 people that show up every weekend now, and for Christmas and Easter, they'll top out at over 1,000, sometimes even 1,200 people. So it's really kind of a, a great deal. But the Life Center is also, it's not just a church, it's a training center for pastors. And I've trained several hundreds of pastors from uh, throughout the state in that, that facility. Uh, the building is five stories high. There's no, no yard. It's just, it covers every square inch of the lot that they have. And there's uh, five stories. Three floors are dormitories and conference rooms. And then they've got a worship center and a kitchen and some office space. Uh, it, the street is right up to the front door, and then there's another street that runs along the side of the building. The back of it, they uh, butt up to a, a piece of property owned by another Christian, and then there's a vacant lot next door. And recently, the owner of the, of the vacant lot said that he would sell it to them uh, for $100,000. And so they're really in need of more space, and it's even uh, kind of crucial from a security standpoint that they have that space, because if they get the wrong neighbor, which they very well could, that neighbor could complain about their activities as Christians and uh, really bring some serious persecution on the church. So uh, we want to help partner with them. We're partnering also with a church, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Rogers, Arkansas, and the Life Center. The three of us are going to go together and try and come up with $100,000 to pay uh, for this, uh, this property. So we don't have to come up with all of it. Any amount we come up with will help move the project forward. And so from now till the end of the year, would encourage you to be praying, asking God what he would have you to give, and uh, just uh, give it to Rockbrook, designate it celebration offering, and uh, we'll get it to the Life Center and see what we can make happen there. You folks have been so generous, so faithful in the past on these kind of deals, so it's just exciting to, to give you the opportunity and see what God's going to do, uh, do here. So now, take out your message notes, open up your Bible or app, your Rockbrook app, and we're going to take a look at the fascinating book of Philippians. Uh, Philippians is a letter, an epistle in the Greek, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church he planted in the city of Philippi. Uh, the church in Philippi was the first church that Paul planted in Europe. Uh, Paul had planned to head east into Asia to share the gospel throughout Asia, but one night he had a dream 
And God told him, no, I don't want you to go east. I want you to go west. I want you to go into Macedonia and into Europe instead. And so that Macedonian call changed the direction of Paul's missionary efforts. It changed the course of history because it brought the church into Europe rather than into, uh, into Asia. And Paul had a deep affection for the church in, in Philippi. He actually spent some time in prison in that city. And, you know, nothing warmed Paul's heart to a place more than a good beating in some prison time. <laughs> and uh, uh, so he had uh, a heart for, uh, for Philippi. Uh, he and his traveling companion Silas had been arrested uh, for preaching the gospel. They'd been beaten, put in chains in the prison. And at midnight... Paul and Silas were singing hymns in their cell, and God sent an earthquake, broke open all the prison doors, broke the chains that they were bound with, and they and all the other prisoners were set free. And the jailer assumed that Paul and Silas had fled, and he was responsible for them, and so he would be executed, so he was about to fall on his sword and kill himself. And Paul said, don't kill yourself, we're still here. And the guy said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And the guy took him, uh, Paul to his home and his whole household believes in Jesus Christ and, and they became uh, a key part of that church in Philippi. You can read that fascinating story in Acts 16. Well, now it's about 10, maybe 12 years later and Paul's in jail again, uh, this time uh, in Rome. And he writes this letter to the church in Philippi to help grow them up. They're an established church, but they need to grow in some areas, kind of like Rockbrook. You know, we're, we're an established church, but we need, uh, we need the topic that Paul covers in Philippians, and that is uh, how to be joyful no matter what the circumstances. And so this little book of Philippians, it's, it's two pages front and back in most Bibles. You can read it in about 12 to 15 minutes, 104 sentences, and Paul mentions joy 16 times. And that joy theme is pretty fascinating because he's writing it from prison. And prison is typically not a very joyful place. I mean, you know, especially a, a Roman jail. I mean, it's a dark, dank, smelly, fetid, putrid place. And Paul was scheduled to be executed. And so he's also chained to a guard 24 hours a day. Eight-hour shifts, they'd rotate these guys in and put the handcuffs on Paul. So, but Paul had always dreamed of going to Rome to, to preach the gospel. Rome was the, the center of power in the world at that time, and Paul wanted to go to that city of influence and preach Christ. But instead, he's arrested in Jerusalem, hauled off to Rome in chains, and placed in this prison. And so let's take a look at what, well, what Paul wrote to the Philippian believers. He, he starts out with, I thank my God. Now, if you were writing a letter from prison, would you start it off with how thankful you are? I, mean, I just want to let you know that if I'm ever in jail and I write you a letter, it's probably going to start with, get me out of here. Okay? It's probably not going to start with, I'm just so grateful. Okay? But that's the journey. That's the journey that we're going to be on the, these next four weeks because it's human nature to respond negatively to difficult circumstances. But God teaches us through the example of the Apostle of Paul how to be joyful no matter what. And so that, that's where we're headed with this series. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with, say the word with me, joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul says to this church in Philippi, he says, every dream we've had since we started this church together, all of those dreams are going to come true in Jesus Christ. And this is coming from a guy who none of his dreams are coming true. He's not planting a church in Rome. He's not preaching in a church in Rome. He's shackled to a guard in a dungeon facing execution. And yet he still has confidence in God's ability to complete his good work in the lives of people. I mean, how do you rise to that level of living life? How, how, do, how do we get joy in that kind of circumstance? 
You know, most of us are involved in the pursuit of happiness. The, the pursuit of happiness is the American dream. I, I'm, I'm going to have plenty of stuff. I'm going to have plenty of pleasure. It's blue skies and bluebirds, baby. But it doesn't always work out that way. And if it doesn't work out that way, it doesn't have to wreck your life. Because you can have something that exceeds happiness. You can have joy. You can have joy. You know, I, I honestly don't think many people experience joy, even though God offers it to all of us. Maybe at best we can get these moments of happiness, but, but do we really discover the deeper joy that God has for us? That's our goal with this. Before we get into the text, I, I want to give you the difference between happiness and joy. On your notes, number one, uh, happiness is external. You're happy when things on the outside of you are great. If the sun's shining, I'm happy. If it's raining, I'm not. It's based on the external. Joy is internal. Joy is not based on the circumstances around you. Joy is something you can have in the middle of your worst day. You know, the Apostle Paul's an expert on worst days. I mean, Paul's led a rough life. If anybody earned the right to talk about having joy on a bad day, it's Paul. In 2 Corinthians 11, I'd encourage you to write that down. 2 Corinthians 11, go home and read that chapter. And Paul just marches through all the things that he'd experienced. You know, five times Paul received 39 lashes. You know the scourging that Jesus got before he went to the cross that almost killed him? Paul had that five times. And he was beaten with rods. He was shipwrecked. He spent a night and a day bobbing around in the Mediterranean Sea like a cork. And then he crawls up onto an island and he's bitten by a poisonous snake. And he was stoned. People pummeled him with rocks until they thought he was dead. But he says this. He says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Imagine what he must have looked like. Seriously. Uh, imagine how battered and beaten his body must have been. Outwardly, we're wasting away, yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. Paul says the outward circumstances are different than the inward responses. I'm different on the inside than things are on the outside, and that's what I want for, for you for, as a result of this series, that, that you'll have joy inside of you that is greater than the fear, than the sadness, than, than the difficulty that you're experiencing on the outside. He says, for our light and momentary troubles, uh, things like being in prison, shipwrecks, beatings, snake bites, stick in whatever you're going through right now. These light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Joy outweighs suffering. Joy outweighs the misery. Joy, get this, joy outweighs happiness. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, the external circumstances, but what is unseen, the internal joy. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Why do we do that? Because next point, happiness is based on circumstance. Circumstance. The hap in happiness in the Latin it means circumstances or luck. Happiness is based on happenings. And with happiness, you're stuck with what happens to you or around you. Uh, circumstances literally means the, the circle you're standing in. It's the place where you choose to dwell. You ever notice that how two different people going through the exact same circumstances can have two totally different responses? Same circumstances, totally different responses. Years ago, I was at a, at a camp. We did a mission trip to a camp in Wisconsin for handicapped adults. And I was out on the nature trail, and there was a lady in a motorized wheelchair uh, driving on the nature trail, and holding on to the, the handles on the back of the wheelchair were two blind ladies. And they were following her along the trail, and the wheelchair lady would stop, and she'd look down at, at the plants along the side of the trail, and she'd describe them to the ladies. And one of the ladies, as she would describe them, she'd say, oh, they're just beautiful wildflowers. 
they're beautiful, they're beautiful. And the other lady would say, it's a weed. She, she, she sounded like Roz in Monsters, Inc., you know. It's a weed, it's a weed. And, and it was just, it was a striking moment for me because I thought, okay, Kelly, what do you see? Wildflowers or weeds? It's a different, same circumstances, same description, same plant, two different outlooks. You know, joy is based on Christ. Joy is based on your relationship with Christ. When you give your life to Christ, he does two, two types of things for you. He does supernatural things and he does natural things. And with the supernatural, when you give your life to Christ, he, he just miraculously changes you on the inside. He makes you a brand new person on the inside. You know, a lot of your old habits, your old lifestyle, your old language, uh, things, it, it changes. It, it's miraculously wonderful. Many of you can, you know, you're nodding your head going, yeah, that's what happened to me. And then the other thing he does is natural. Some things don't happen supernaturally or miraculously. You just have to learn them over time. A lot of Christianity is learning to become like Christ over time. Philippians 4, Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Paul says, I've learned some stuff that, I, that I'm trying to teach you in this letter. I've learned to be content. I've learned to be joyful, no matter what. You know, the Christian life, it's supernatural and miraculous, and it's natural, and it has to be learned. One more difference between happiness and joy. Happiness happens by chance. You know, it, it, it's not up to you. In fact, it's beyond your control. It's, it just happens by chance. Joy happens by choice. By choice. Be careful not to let the things you can't control control you. Don't let the things you can't control control you. If you're at mercy of the things you can't control, Paul teaches us very clearly in Philippians, there's another way to live. There's another path that you can choose. You can choose joy. Now, you cannot avoid bad circumstances. We live on, on a cursed earth. We live in bodies that are wasting away. We are surrounded by evil all around us. But in the middle of all of that, there's a choice. There's a choice. Deuteronomy 30, 19. God says, This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. Choose life. Choose joy. Make a choice. You know, the joy that this shipwrecked, arrested, beaten, imprisoned, grizzled old apostle had, that joy is available to you today. Joy, no matter what. But it's a choice. And then Paul, the next thing he does in this letter is he prays. And I'll tell you, as your pastor, I, I'm praying this prayer over you. So re receive these next few verses as my prayer over you. It says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. There are some things you need to learn. There are some things that need to happen to you supernaturally. And so I'm praying that today you'll take some notes. You'll write some things down. You'll learn something from this sermon. And I'm also praying that something supernatural will happen inside of you today because of this message. That in some way, you'll become a new person. So that you may be able to discern. Circle that word, discern. Because there's another bad day coming. And in that day, you're going to have to discern what is best. So that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You know, Paul had, Paul had high hopes for the Philippian church. I got high hopes for you guys. That, that no matter what the circumstances, you're going to rise to the level that you live for the glory and praise of Jesus Christ. 
And then Paul dives into the secret of why he can be so joyful in his jail cell. You want to know how to have joy no matter what? Write this down. Number one, stop asking why. When we face bad circumstances, it is human nature to ask why. But the danger is you can die in your whys. You can get stuck in your whys. And if you get stuck in your whys, you'll never find the solution. You have to move past the distraction of what happened to you. Too many of us get frozen wondering why. But the truth is, there are not a lot of answers to why. And sadly, the most common answer to why is simply one word, sin. Sin. And I don't say that to place blame on you. You know, bad things happen because of my sin, your sin, a stranger's sin, Adam and Eve's sin, the sin of the world. I'm not blaming you. I'm just, you know, the world was broken when we got here. We showed up broken by sin. And so bad things happen to, to, to everybody. I mean, look at this promise from Jesus in John 16. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. The Bible never promises you that you won't have trouble. The Bible promises you that when you have trouble, you will also have Jesus Christ. You'll have his peace, you'll have his joy in the midst of your trouble. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, arrested, placed in prison, awaiting execution, Paul says, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. You know, Paul, Paul's not asking why here. You know, I, I, as a pastor, I've gotten my share of why questions from people. I got my own why questions. You know, I, I, I've got my own set of, you know, but I've just decided to table the whys until I get to heaven. I'm, I'm really banking that in heaven there's going to be a Q&A, and, uh, and I'm going to get to ask all my whys. But what I really think is going to happen is that all my whys are going to fade into insignificance in that moment. You know, Paul says all our troubles are going to be superseded by glory. So be careful not to die in your whys. Don't get stuck asking why. Instead, Paul says, number two, he says, start asking what? What? Lord, what is your purpose in this? What are you trying to teach me through this? What do you want me to do in response to this? You know, we've got to take the microscope off of God and stop asking him why he did something and turn the microscope onto ourselves and ask, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do in response? Because if you start asking the question, God, what's your purpose in this? That's the pathway to joy. Because when you start asking that question, you're going to discover that God is up to something powerful in your life. God's doing something powerful in your life, even in your dark days. You want to know what God was up to in the life of the Apostle Paul? Paul ends up writing the book that we're studying today, almost 2,000 years later. In fact, Paul wrote a bunch of the Bible while he was in prison. He he didn't get to do what he thought God called him to do, which is preach in Rome and plant more churches. Instead, he got to do what God really wanted him to do, which was write a big chunk of the Bible and teach us how to be joyful no matter what. Every one of your bad days is an opportunity for you to do something that God wants you to do. You start seeing that, it's going to lead to joy. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Paul says, I didn't get to preach in the churches in Rome. I didn't get to preach in the city square in Rome, but I got to preach in the prison to the whole palace guard. You know, they'd send these guards down into the dungeon to guard Paul, and, and they'd be chained to him for eight hours at a whack, and Paul would just share the gospel with the guy the whole time he was down there. And and these guys started getting saved. And the whole palace guard and everyone else knew why Paul was in prison. And it didn't just affect the people in the prison, it affected people outside the prison. It says, because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. 
The believers on the outside heard, well, Paul's preaching the gospel in prison. I ought to be able to preach the gospel out here where I'm free. And it made them more confident to share the gospel. Paul says, this wasn't my plan. And yes, prison is hard. But look what God is doing in the midst of all of this. Mature disciples say in the midst of difficult circumstances, God has got to be doing something good in this. You know, one of the most powerful verses in the whole Bible is Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know. Circle the word know. I'm, I'm telling you, I'll tell you what I'm teaching you today. I know this. I know this. In the 47 years that I've been a believer, there have been times when I've been in difficult circumstances. Frankly, there have been times when I thought God was asleep at the wheel. But you know what? God was right on target. And I realized God has rescued and redeemed me and used the icky junk in my life. I mean, I'm old enough, I'm seasoned enough that I know, I know this, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And that takes you to the third principle. And, and this, one, this one's an art form. You have to learn how to do this. And that is refocus on what really matters. You know, there are a lot of things that matter to us, but what really matters? In the light of eternity, there are only a few things that really matter. Back in the early days of Rockbrook, we did a spiritual growth campaign called One Month to Live. And we looked at what would matter to us if we had one month to live. And, and it was a powerful, powerful study. You know, Paul says, you want to know the secret to overcoming a, a bad day? Refocus on what really matters. And then he shifts gears here to address something that, that's come to his attention. In, in, the, in the 10, 12 years since he planted the church in Philippi, other churches have sprung up. And some of the pastors of these other churches had questionable motives. Some of them had even been saying bad things about Paul and Paul's church. And people have been writing letters to Paul in prison, telling him about this, trying to stir him up. Okay? Look at his response. He says, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. Now look at this. Paul says, but what does it matter? <laughs> Paul says, you know, you got people trying to stir things up in the church and they're trying to embarrass me because I'm in prison. They're trying to make things difficult for me. He says, what does it matter? So what? <laughs> says the important thing is, that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. You know, bad days plagued Paul. This wasn't his only time in prison. This wasn't the first time he'd been beaten. This wasn't the only time he faced opposition within the church. Paul faced this stuff all the time, but he made a choice to rejoice. He joiced once and now he's going to joice again. Okay? He's going to rejoice. And they could beat Paul, but it didn't intimidate him. They could throw him in jail. It didn't intimidate him. They could threaten to cut it off his head. And Paul said, oh, would you? <laughs> you know, he had this dilemma. He says, I, I can't decide whether it's better to be executed and go be with Jesus or be released and be able to preach the gospel and come see you again. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live, I get to preach Christ. If I die, I get to meet Christ. He says, there's no way you can lose. Some of you need to understand that today. There's no way you can lose if you trust in Jesus Christ. Look what Paul told his young pastor friend, Timothy. This is shortly before Paul was beheaded. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack 
and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to heaven. Paul says, if I'm, if I'm released, uh, that's great. If, I, if I'm rescued, that's great. If I go to heaven, that's great. But which one's it going to be? Paul says, I don't care. Pick one. Pick one. Because when you know Christ, you're in a win-win situation. You know, so often life seems to offer us lose-lose. I remember as, I, as a kid, my mom said, I'm doomed if I do and doomed if I don't. You know, I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. And then along comes Jesus and offers us win-win. You know, what are you going to choose? What are you going to choose? Wildflowers or weeds? Let's pray. If you've never made the choice of trusting in Jesus Christ, I'd invite you to make that choice right now. Let Jesus do a miraculous, supernatural work in your heart and life. And then let him teach you day by day a new way to live. Would you just pray this prayer with me in your own, in your own heart and mind? Just say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and paying for my sins. And I ask you to forgive me for going my own way. Today, I give you my life. Be the Lord of my life. Change me supernaturally. And help me to naturally learn the lessons you want me to learn. Jesus, today I choose joy regardless of my circumstances. And I thank you for the hope of heaven when I die. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.